Okay, everyone. Uh, next speaker is Ilya Tonev from Trollbound. Ilya expected to travel for the conference, and then he found out that the conference was actually in Breda, where he's also <laughs> located. Yeah. Take it away, Ilya. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, hello everyone, uh, Ronnie introduced me. My name is Ilya. Welcome to this talk called World Building Pipeline at Swirlbound. Uh, let's see what we're going to cover. Firstly, I'll briefly introduce myself and then we're going to cover what caused a game designer, which, such as myself, to venture into the path of Houdini. The gist of the presentation is um, the creation of a world building pipeline and tool set that we are using in our uh, new project, mainly its requirements and specifications. Um, very importantly, how we, large, uh, how we manage large sets of user-generated data that uh, is used by this pipeline. And finally, uh, on that note, uh, the tips and techniques that I discovered along the way whilst I was creating it. And I want to wrap up by uh, talking a bit about Houdini through the perspective of a non-traditional user such as myself. I'm, as I said, uh, primarily a game designer uh, in my day-to-day. Um, but uh, before delving uh, more in detail, uh, I think this talk is mainly focused around people that are developing like a world building pipelines or, or tools for particularly small teams, uh, teams or technical directors that have extremely limited uh, code support in engine. And the reason I want us to focus around uh, the small team's uh, lack of programming is uh, I think there's a lot of resources for specific Houdini techniques that get you from uh, to solving like very practical problems. But in terms of uh, thinking about tool architecture that can integrate multiple people without uh, code support, I think there's not a lot in there. So hopefully my talk contributes to that. Um, I think uh, the techniques are, that are covered are mo mostly beginner to intermediate, uh, at least for Houdini users. And uh, it's primarily focused for Unity Engine, but I'm sure that the knowledge translates to Unreal as well. A bit about me. Uh, my name is Ilya, as I ex ex uh, established. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Turbound, uh, which is a small game dev studio which is based here in Breda that focuses on colorful open world action adventures. Um, again, I'm a game designer by trade, but I'm currently wearing a lot of hats for the project. Uh, but officially, I'm the lead designer for, uh, for this unannounced project that we're working on. Um, I have a background in AAA. I've worked on uh, AC Origins and Horizon, and obviously our uh, previous uh, projects for the studio, which is Pine. And in order to give you like a better f flavor of what we are working on, here's a trailer from our previous game. So, why is a person such as myself talking to you about Houdini? Um, I think to explore that, we need to talk about Pine a little bit, well, which is our first project. And it was set in a two by two square kilometer open world where AI tribes were driven by a simulation and they were fighting, they were trading, and that was the USP of the project. Um, the game was built by a core team of seven and uh, the world was built by two designers and one environment artist. Uh, it featured four biomes, 21 villages, and three large vaults, which is essentially our version of uh, linear levels. And you would think with a small team like that, we had a pretty powerful world building process. But in reality, it was uh, everything in terms of the terrain was manually painted, the terrain was sculpted by uh, either one of the designers or the environment artist. So you can think about roads, rivers, basically everything. Of course, uh, I think somebody yesterday mentioned 
that we had a boutique approach of <laughs> manually hand placing everything. And um, at the end of this project, I vouched to never do this again. Um, so yeah, this had to change, and we had a new project uh, in the works. Uh, I knew about Houdini from Ubisoft, and, and I decided to try it for at least two months and see, can I contribute to solving some of the issues that we were having? Um, I fell in love with it very fast. I, I was able to pick it up very uh, quickly, I think. And at first, like the designer procedural artist hybrid, that's not very common, I think. Uh, but we ended up going for it. And I've been developing like this uh, pipeline and uh, smaller tools for the past year and a half, mostly part-time, uh, because I need to uh, lead design as well. Um, uh, I had something going, uh, I think, and that was like my experience. I've seen other people build tools, uh, and I knew what I should imitate, so I, what I should fake in general. And, and something that uh, was very important for me is that the requirements, the pipeline requirements were set from the start. Uh, and those were that multiple people need to be working uh, simultaneously on the terrain and tools. Uh, whatever we do uh, uh, procedurally needs to allow for a manual and uh, non-procedural approaches as well, and also support uh, fully hand-authored areas, because this boutique approach needed to be used a bit more sparingly this time. Uh, the final look of the area uh, should be viewable within one or two minutes for the person that is working with it. Uh, it should uh, feature flexible biome definition uh, that is easily adjustable uh, and support sub-biomes, which is a, a term that we use for different splat map and scattering rules within the hat of a biome. So in the picture, you see an open sub-biome, which is primarily uh, loosely scattered and a dense one on, on, this, on the side, which is a forest. Uh, this time around, we try to automate as much as possible. Uh, here are some of the things that the pipeline supports. Um, but I think I'm introducing a few terms that I think vary wildly from studio to studio. So uh, we, we call pipeline inputs uh, loose tools that uh, have debug visualization and some parameters to alter their look. Uh, and pipelines that uh, basically feed off of these pipeline inputs uh, and perform complex tasks and output a result. And, and our process goes from the designer or the level artist would uh, set up these individual tools. Uh, they would uh, bake them into files, and those files would then be taken into the pipelines, and they do uh, stuff with it. Uh, we're going to focus on the terrain pipeline tool, which we call proxy terrain tool. And uh, the process of it in engine looks a bit uh, like this. So it starts with a preview mode in which like, the user can uh, select uh, an area of the map that they want to work on. Uh, in this case, uh, there's nothing here except the grass and the, and the splat map that was generated. Uh, so in the video, I change that. I give it uh, some mountains, a pond, a river, and uh, very loosely uh, and roughly shape it in. Uh, this is uh, not for beauty's sake, but just how, how it works uh, for a designer. Uh, after we're happy, uh, you input that data into the data, data manager, and uh, that sole purpose is to output files for the pipelines to feed. And in the final process of this video, I refresh each input one by one so that we can uh, view it gradually until, yeah, we have some sort of a, I would say, first look. <laughs> and this cannot be uh, something that is, can be used in production, but yes. Right, and that's the final result. Um, so how, how is this set up architecturally? very, uh, in very layman's terms. Uh, this is a legend for somebody who wants to uh, get back to it afterwards, but in a nutshell, uh, an, uh, in a blank height field is initialized, uh, and that is layered with a uh, base that was provided by our uh, art lead, and then uh, biomes were generated on that base. Then uh, all of the terraforming is handled, and that comes into the form of uh, manually authored terrains, uh, subtractive, additive shapes, 
Uh, then we have the concept of fields, roads, rivers, and ponds. Uh, and afterwards comes the heavy hitters in terms of performance, which is like the splat map generation, mainly because of like the mask authoring. Uh, and I try to give the user the ability to switch out of it because not all tasks require you to view the grass and view uh, like uh, textures of the terrain. And finally, the, the, there's a preview system that I'm going to cover and uh, the final output of all of this generation. And the user is also able to uh, save this height field uh, as a separate file. And this is mainly for me to debug and for subsequent pipelines to, to take this data and interpret it further. Uh, some of the techniques I discovered along the way, uh, I chose a few of them. Um, and those were, were chosen basically on what took me most time to figure out. Um, at the start of the process is this uh, height map base that was uh, provided by our art director. Uh, it's composed in Gaia, but uh, it's important to say that Houdini is also super capable of providing something like this, and you can just cache it out. But bringing it is super easy through the height field node, which is layered onto this blank height field. And of course, uh, I, on minute one, I came to the realization that processing 4x4 four four, uh, world is not a very good idea, especially considering other people involved. So I had to come up with uh, something very simple. And some of the questions that helped me uh, reach this simple solution was like, do you really need to actually view the 4x4 four four world all the time? Um, are you working on the rough shape or are you finalizing the look of an area? And uh, do you need a grass or even textured terrain to perform your task? And yeah, this preview system is incredibly simple. Um, and uh, that is, it's driven by a grid that just holds the image of the world map and a box where the size controls the size of the tile that you want to preview, and its center drives the center of the height field so that uh, you can choose where you want to work. And of course, you expose the terrain resolution. It's always a good idea. And uh, expose the handle so that the user doesn't punch in coordinates because uh, that's a bit unintuitive. Uh, the biggest takeaway, at least for me, when, because I was a novice at the time, was switching from putting the live HDAs into the pipelines and caching them out into files. Uh, this is like a, the simplest tool that I've built. I feel it's like a multi-parm that just takes the HDAs uh, and splits them into files per type. So you can think of the mountain shapes are a file, uh, the roads and rivers are a file, and yeah, this files on disk uh, are super standard, uh, and the reason I'm showing that is because uh, some of the huge benefits to this approach is that you can debug everything in Houdini. Uh, I don't know if you've opened debug sessions uh, into the engines, and that, that's a bit of a pain, at least I found it to be a bit of a pain. Uh, you can track if a tool type is exploding in size, perhaps like you're not cleaning up all the parameters or groups, yeah, you're working a bit messy, so this is a nice, nice way to find out what's going on. And of course, uh, uh, there was a big performance gain in engine for the user working, because once you start putting 20 uh, roads and rivers, uh, and you move a river, you have to basically recook uh, the entire thing, which is not very nice. Uh, in terms of supporting biomes and sub-biomes, or how do we get from this raw terrain data to like this nicely sectored terrain that has different rules? Um, my process is very simple. I convert the initial height field, and through a bitmap, I feed it some color, uh, colors that are then interpreted in VEX, and each color is assigned an, in an index. Sub-biomes, which are again under the biomes, are always initialized as index zero. You can do something cool like fracturing the terrain and give it like a random initialization value, but this is what we wanted in the end. And uh, these indexes are then promoted to a detail attribute with their max number. Because in the following process, through a CSV, I uh, match the, uh, this index that was generated with a bit more human readable name. This, was, this can be edited by a user externally to Houdini because it's just a CSV. Um, and in VEX, uh, with two for loops, you can start uh, matching the biomes and sub-biome pairings. And uh, this 
formula generates a unique index that I think is very helpful subsequently. And out of this, um, uh, because you have from the CSV the human readable names, you can uh, promote, you can create a group that has a very nice name that can pair the biome and subbiomes. Uh, the final part of this process is the simplest, I think. Uh, we have configured this geometry and it holds all the information, so we can start processing it in a loop where the iteration amount is the unique pairings that we've found. Uh, of course, we have the name of the mask because we did that into the VEX code. And uh, in hindsight, I'm sure <laughs> there's easier ways and like uh, that don't require such a uh, long network to realize. Uh, I think what it has going for it is that it's relatively fast and uh, it can be edited outside of Houdini by basically everyone with a Photoshop and uh, Excel. Uh, in terms of terrain compositing, uh, I want to cover some terraforming lessons that I learned, uh, learned the hard way, my process for splat map and ground cover support, and a bit about water mesh generation, which is mainly a hack that I, I used <laughs> to get it going. Um, so uh, the problem here is how do we get from the same manual terrain inputs into something that is a bit uh, blended into the terrain because we have a manual terrain and shapes that need to integrate with each other. Um, uh, firstly, for me, it was very important to establish like what is the hierarchy of these shapes. And at the bottom, we had like these manually, uh, manual terrains because they, were, they are the destructive part of this pipeline. Uh, then uh, the subtractive shapes and then the protruding shapes. And uh, mostly afterwards in these uh, systems, it's about projecting this data into uh, this initial height field. And I, of course, started with an over-engineered solution, uh, which was basically to process each input individually. Uh, and I would create a mask around uh, the projected shapes where it matches the terrain uh, and blur the edges based on this mask, which uh, it's surely not worth the computational power that uh, you're doing, and I think it produces like varying results because the terrain is not consistent everywhere. And a simpler solution is to project all shapes at once, create a mask around uh, that shape, and slump the projected mask to, for better integration. At least for us, that uh, produced a better result. Uh, in terms of ground cover and splat maps, I uh, always uh, I have for both like this process where. We've uh, generated our uh, biomes, so we have a mask for that. And out of it, we can start uh, cutting out and processing out some of the features of the terrain, such as the riverbed, the dirt, the cliffs, the grass. Uh, we merge all these results and blast everything that isn't those masks. And finally, we bring it back to the terrain with the labs tool, which I'm using quite extensively. This one just makes your networks a lot more clean, I, I found. Uh, processing, again, means just uh, standard mask operations that I used in order to get to the final look. Uh, there's tons of resources that are way better than me uh, in teaching you how to use these more efficiently. And yeah, plants and ground cover, they are basically, uh, again, you need a mask with a detail in order to get them into engine. Um, after processing our terrain in such manner, we have a very neat hierarchy uh, where we decided which layer is going to be on top and which one on the bottom. And this is important because at least the Unity engine requires um, uh, something very explicit, which is at each coordinate, uh, all the splat, values, splat map values should uh, sum up to one. So in order to achieve that, the topmost priority layer of, uh, of, of this uh, terrain is added to a temp mask, and in a loop, uh, we start iterating through the masks underneath, where this temp mask is subtracted from the currently processed one, and after the subtraction, the result is added to the temp mask so that you can keep subtracting until you reach uh, like this requirement. And with an if switch, we can uh, mask out the default height and mask layers. Uh, I want to talk about a small tip that I discovered. It took me uh, a lot of time, and it's the simplest technique, I think. It, I don't, I don't want to call it a technique, even. Um, so in our pipeline, the terrain scattering is a separate tool, um, and uh, it's split up per biome. And in, thus far, we've created a lot of useful masks that we want to use 
hopefully uh, in our subsequent tools. But because of this requirement that all um, uh, splat map values at a coordinate need to be a value of one, uh, there's a limitation to the Houdini engine, which even, as, soon as, you as soon as you name your mask, uh, it starts adding it uh, to, to this uh, requirement, and it basically explodes your values. Uh, there's a small trick that I use to save those masks, and that is uh, hidden within the docs, which is like the mask layer is not used to create these terrain layers. So in VEX, uh, we can uh, choose the things that we want to store uh, and basically uh, give them a different string uh, attribute and then rename it to mask. So at the end, you have a lot of mask and next to it uh, some names that would subsequently uh, will help you unpack them in, in the following tools. In terms of road and water mesh generation, uh, projecting shapes is easy. I can do it, uh, so everybody can do it. However, uh, merging shapes, uh, the individual shapes from tools and creating a continuous shapes uh, that sits nicely into the terrain and the crossroads are interpreted nicely was hard for me, at least. Uh, or in simple terms, how do we get like from this disjointed planes into uh, something that is ready for flow map support and sits nicely into the base of the terrain? Uh, we have a super messy uh, input at the start. Uh, with a labs tool, we can uh, get a very good head start, uh, which gives us basically a unified shape that is flattened. Um, and I was like, oh, this is it, I'm done. But uh, sometimes uh, with this, uh, I found some instability where the geometry would get a bit corrupted, uh, and I was uh, projecting it back, and it didn't give me the results I wanted. So I had to process it further. And the thing that the labs tool uh, gives us, though, is uh, an index that we, uh, for the prim number that we can um, project onto the raw inputs. So yeah, in the following step, we can start uh, iterating over this uh, prim index for all of the connected shapes that, uh, for all of the shapes that are supposed to be connected. Uh, yeah, we blast everything that is not the currently uh, processed uh, prim identifier. Um, I learned that if you're, uh, for example, for water and mesh generation, uh, I'm processing rivers and lakes simultaneously. It's good to split the two for the subsequent part, which is I copy metaballs onto uh, like the input geometry and then merge it back in and convert it to polygons. And uh, this gives like a nice topology and like initial result. Uh, I was thinking like, oh, maybe this can be a cave uh, for the future if you invert it. Uh, but yeah, uh, afterwards uh, we can uh, delete the normals that are pointing up. And in the final processing, uh, you can uh, blast everything except the points, uh, sort them based on X and Y in order to get the point numbers to be nicely following along, and creating a single polygon that this time the shape comes out uh, very clean, and we can project it onto the terrain, remesh it, and it will sit nicely into the river cavity. Um, I want to wrap up this talk by talking a bit about uh, why is interesting? Why Houdini is interesting through the lens of a, of a game designer, or uh, making a case on training more people that are doing game design into any form of proceduralism? Um, I don't know if you've encountered, but a lot of Houdini resources start with the idea that artists need to reprogram their brain in order to start using it. Um, for system designer, I, I think I, I had it uh, a bit a, a bit easier time in order to wrap my head around it. Like for example, this is a AI behavior diagram that I was doing on the project, and this is like the Houdini network. And I was like, oh, okay, these look kind of similar. I know what to do with them, uh, roughly. I don't know the um, environment art and the tech art part of it, but I'm sure I'm gonna pick it up. Um, and why is this important? Why, why is it important that game designers are trained in this, I think, uh, is because uh, of some of the things that I was doing on the side even. And that was, in our game we have, in our new game, we have this concept of, of an ingredient that makes the player, as it passes through, it speeds them up crazily. 
And because I was the architect of the, of the tools, I can start messing around a lot with it. Uh, the density of this uh, on a large area is very difficult for a game designer to test uh, by hand, because uh, realistically, on one by one, it's very hard to place manually uh, like these ingredients. Uh, you can uh, figure out how are you going to show it better to the player, for example. Are you going to clear the grass around it? Are you going to bump up uh, a bit the height field in order underneath each and one of them in order to make it pop from the environment? Uh, in terms of uh, another thing that I used Houdini for was like finding the best visual and gameplay for a mechanic. In this one particularly, the player can enter this wind current and be picked up. And with a simple curve and like... Uh, um, um, a sweep around it, you can create all the, all the shapes that you can think of in like a day and figure out, okay, do I need this to be this long or that long or uh, do I need it to make it uh, a bit more comfortable to get in? Uh, other thing that I was experimenting is uh, a mechanic that would evolve over time and this was just a prototype visualization of a resource that you need to cut the ties to it in order for it to fall. Uh, and I was uh, very easily uh, able to uh, find out how many tethers before this becomes a chore, right? And I can experiment with the, how wide it can be, what sort of environment can host a mechanic like this. Or, <laughs> uh, for a bit of like combat set spectacle, you can think of how can I take all the assets from the art director, break them, in order to, when you swing your sword, to like break everything. Uh, basically. Um, in conclusion, I think there's an extreme potential for prototyping and testing out ideas with Houdini. The process of plugging it in into an engine requires no code support, at least on, a, on the level that we're using it. And um, I think the procedural way of thinking is very close to what a system designer does on a day-to-day. -day. Uh, most importantly, testing ideas on large scale is now within reach. Uh, the ability to change your mind for, let's say, I want um, all of these movement ingredients to be scattered every single meter in order to find the best feel for the game. And in today's climate, I think if you're a game or a level designer, you need to be versed in 3D content creation in some form. Uh, we usually default to Blender and Maya for some reason, uh, but I actually think uh, Houdini is more appropriate for a uh, game designer to pick up in order to uh, be capable of doing like this basic 3D work that uh, they require. And I'm surely like uh, as a tool and uh, as a toy box for designers, it's way more powerful than teaching somebody how to push polygons because uh, you're trying to solve different problems as a, as a game designer. Uh, with that, I want to conclude. Thank you very much for listening, and if you have any questions. Any questions? If you have questions, please raise your hand. Uh, Paul? Hi, thanks for the talk. I, uh, I just had a question about uh, getting started with Houdini. Um, you know, what kind of uh, struggles did you have as a, a designer picking it up? Oh, um, well, I, I had a lot of experience with visual scripting. Um, I, I was doing missions on, on AC, so I, I had a lot of fun. I, I don't, I, I'm now looking how can I do more of Houdini. Uh, on my day-to-day. -day. I think uh, the biggest struggle maybe is like these uh, super tech art specific topics such as like fixing up the splat map so that it come up uh, correctly. Um, being a bit more aware of uh, scattering and performance, but I guess this is like somebody, everybody tackles this problem. Uh, yeah, just being, um, how do you say it, responsible. You need to be more responsible. Uh, yeah, it's. I had a blast. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Thanks for the talk. Um, yeah. To follow up on that, I was also curious. Um, 
just how you kind of got started because uh, just watching the presentation there was immediately a lot going on that uh, made me think oh that's actually mm -hmm. quite a lot for someone who I think said you yeah. were just sort of getting started with Houdini or were relatively new to um, it. My process was very simple. I, I knew what I needed to solve and I could like uh, start looking for resources that touch on the topic. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of courses on creating environments with Houdini, so this was my starting point. Like, uh, how can I create a terrain and then put something on it? That was the initial problem that I was trying to solve. And as I got better, um, I was able to go to people and say, um, do you need something to solve? Because I'm having so much fun uh, in the software. And yeah, uh, that, that's sort of uh, how it went for us. So you really took some time to like, fully focus on Houdini? Yeah, uh, in, in our studio at the time, we were in a transition between two projects. So it was a bit less of pressure to like, deliver deadlines and, uh, and stuff like that. So I was, um, at, that, at that time, I was like, OK, we have like this one or two months of experimentation. I'm going to fully, five days a week, like fully focus on it in order to create something that would look appealing to the team so that um, they are receptive. And we don't go with like uh, an empty promise of uh, we are going to integrate it uh, and it's all going to magically work well. Uh, I had like a very simple prototype with like a large environment with roads and scattering and it was already, our processes was pretty bad uh, uh, of manually placing everything. So uh, I started off from a very low bar, uh, basically, to, uh, to convince people. All right. Makes sense. Thanks. Uh, hey, uh, so are you the only designer in your company right now that is? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> are you the only designer in the company right no. now that knows Houdini, or are you actually teaching others, or how does, does that go? Ah, OK. Uh, yeah, I'm the only person in the studio that does Houdini, and uh, I have uh, designer buddies that just do the design and integration of uh, the tools. All right. Hi, so first of all, like really nice talk. I wish like every designer knew Houdini. <laughs> but um, it's, um, it was really interesting, like the way that you approach it, kind of like you don't want to open like a live session with the Houdini engine from Unity. You kind of like create intermediate outputs from Unity that then Houdini reads, yeah. right? Do you use like any sort of like file format for that? Or like each I... file is like a different format that you created or? Okay, I uh, went on a limb. And I knew that uh, the .bgo is the uh, Houdini native format. So I haven't tested it, but I was thinking, oh, if it's the native format, it surely is the best for, uh, uh, for interpreting the data. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that is really good for it is that your attributes come out uh, as you left them. Right, and it's like kind of easy to offer that from Unity because I guess you are generating these files um, geo from Unity itself. So. Unity, do, I, I don't open it ever. Like these files, I never open in Unity yeah. because the pipeline just takes the files, mm -hmm. does something with them, and outputs uh, the. the, but, the but, final you process, but you process them in Unity, right? Like you output the .geo from Unity, or yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's a simple export button okay. that you can say. I want all the rivers in a file now. Nice. It's, uh, nice. Like we have like a lot of custom formats for like some of our tools, and I was yeah. just I, I saw that they were all like .geo, and I'm yeah. not like a Houdini guy myself. Like I'm a rendering yeah. engineer. In in other tools, um, like for example the um, uh, barrel that was exploding, mm -hmm. uh, that is an FBX export with the animation right. on top. Uh, and yeah, we mainly use FBX and. Um, I use Bigeo, and for the FBX, it's, um, our programmers wrote like a very nice tool that if you give it in a certain format, uh, the FBX, they automatically create the prefab, they set up all the LUDs, uh, they set up the correct material, so you're like, uh, as a user, if you want to export the barrel, you're just like, give me an FBX, and it puts out a prefab, which right. is uh, very nice. Fair enough, thanks. Yeah. Any online questions, Brian? 
Yes, plenty. Okay, we have a question from Jonathan. He's asking whether the HDAs, HDAs were mostly left in the level, uh, or would you store them separately in a sub-level? Um, uh, that's a good question. Uh, we have a separate scene for them, and basically because I'm responsible for the final bake-out of the terrain, I uh, collect all the tools and I create a snapshot of, of them uh, very quickly and I output the, the final bake, which we use for the building of the game. Thank yeah, you. so it's uh, stored in a separate scene. All the tools are stored in... They are stored in separate scenes, I'm sorry. Okay. And I compile them in a final one. <laughs> Uh, I think that was clear. Uh, Nicholas is uh, saying, first of all, beautiful talk. And he's also asking, how do you control the impact that artists, designers, and even Houdini have on the terrain to not lose the initial shape uh, erosion details coming from uh, Jaya? Uh, OK, for the mountain shapes, uh, we, we have two, two types. Uh, one, we inputs ProBuilder data, which is the equivalent of BSP and Unreal. Uh, we use that for uh, prototyping, but we also have like these stamps that uh, our art director is uh, preparing, which have the same erosion passes that the initial terrain has. So the way that this can go wrong is when a user is painting the manual destructive terrain. And yeah, in this one we just, are, I guess, mindful of using the manual terrains as, list, as least as possible. Okay, I think that was also a clear answer. Uh, there is, I'll have time for two more questions. One is from, from Jan, he's asking if the height map were locked in the beginning, uh, and if, if you did not, uh, did you do anything to support adapting the inputs to it? I, I didn't hear the last part, I'm sorry. If you did, uh, if you did support adapting the inputs to it to the height map, my guess. Um, no, I wish. Uh, but uh, like each individual tool can uh, take the terrain as input in order to adjust itself, and then when you bake it, I guess you get the same, like the same effect. But automatically, when somebody changes changes the base height map to adjust everything. Uh, that's in our next project. I, I make a promise for it. Okay. And uh, uh, the last question coming from Tim uh, is uh, whether, uh, why you use splat maps instead of a landscape material? Uh, just, uh, I think the landscape material is something that is unreal. If, if correct, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. I, I think this is uh, the conversion thing that I'm, I was talking about. Uh, in Unity, they're called terrain layers. Like that concept is called terrain layers. Okay. Thank you very much. That's all the time that we had for, for questions. But you can find uh, Ilya and asking questions during the, the break. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.